Thanks, Bruce. Uh, I'm Steve Adams, and I'm the president of the American Institute for Economic Research. And we are just delighted to have all of you here this afternoon uh, to hear our special guest. Oh, Aaron, good to see you. Ambassador William Mindorf. Uh, all of us who've lived through the uh, tail end of the Cold War, Cold War uh, with the fall of the Iron Curtain, the liberation of Eastern Europe, China opening its economy up and trying to have warm relations, we would all be forgiven uh, if we were hoping the days of mutually assured destruction and saber rattling were behind us. Uh, but sadly, even though the most recent events of the current months, recent months tell us that the world hasn't changed that much. With the Soviet, you know, the Russians invading Ukraine, the Chinese, as you'll hear from the ambassador, are more or less on a war footing in many respects. Um, the 2015 National Security Strategy Report just released by the Joint Chiefs made the following statement. Today, the probability of U.S. involvement in interstate war with a major power is assessed to be low, but not but growing. So we're in a very uncertain time, both national security-wise and, as you all, if you, if you watch the economic news as we do regularly, extreme uncertainty in economic times. So we're extremely fortunate to have an expert observer of both the economic situation and the national security situation. For over 50 years, J. William Middendorf has helped shape the political the foreign policy and intellectual landscape of this nation. He was ambassador to the Netherlands in 1969. He was uh, made secretary of the Navy under President Ford, during which time the Trident subsystem, the Aegis crystal, miss, missile system were developed. President Reagan made him our representative to the Organization of, of American States when the Latin America was a tinderbox. Whenever there were uh, troubling times, it seemed that world leaders turned to William Middendorf to try to bring a calm head to the situation. He also co-founded the Marine Corps Marathon and ran, eight, ran it eight times. He was a member of the field hockey, U.S. national field hockey team. During all this years of public service, he found some time, somehow, to compose numerous symphonies, uh, marches, amass a significant collection of art to produce quite a lot of art himself. At an age when most men uh, would sit and rest on their laurels, William Middendorf continues to press hard his public service. He's the chairman of the Committee for Monetary Research and Education. He's on the Board of Trustees at the Heritage Foundation, one of this nation's premier international think, uh, intellectual think tanks. And he travels the nation and the world to advise leaders about the economy and national security. So I'm just delighted to introduce our AIER member, William Middendorf. Thanks for being here. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mr. President. I'm delighted to be here. How many of, how many uh, here have served in the military? Just about everybody, the males. It's, that's an honor to be with you because you're the heroes, and uh, the country owes so much to you. Uh, and. Uh, Having uh, today, uh, I was talking to the chief of naval operations. Uh, I gave a dinner for him a couple of weeks ago, and he said that 80 percent of the young people today, getting out of high school, don't qualify for the military, either from narcotics use or arrests or or not being in physical shape and what have you. And even if you do qualify, it's a year's waiting list to get in. Uh, and uh, uh, so, but many of you, I can see from your age groups, uh, probably went in when I did 75 years ago uh, to the Navy or Marine Corps, Army, uh, Coast Guard. And um, so we have a lot in common. And I, I admire what you did. Uh, I. Uh, wrote a book recently called Potomac Fever and uh, talked about, it's not, I'm not pushing the book, it's boring by the way. But I recount some of the events over the last 75 years. I was telling Mr. President that he said, well, Bill, you've had a lot of experience and all that. I said, and, and, and done some things. And I said, well, basically, just by living long enough, you get kicked around by experts for 75, 80 years, 90 years. I'm 91. 
but um, and you, and even after making your fifth mistake, you finally even a mule can learn something. And <laughs> I picked up a few things. But Harry Truman uh, talked about Potomac fever, and by the way, he he had one great statement in his whole life. I never respected anything he did except save my life, which is he uh, used the nuclear bomb, and uh, I was under orders to be, be part of the invasion of Japan, and Buper sent out a notice, good news and bad news, half of you are going to live and half are going to die, hmm. um, and uh, that's the bad news. And uh, uh, But I was always counting on being on the good side, and uh, what happened was that the beaches were all named after the American automobile companies. There was Cadillac Beach and, and Chrysler Beach and what have you. And I was assigned to Cadillac Beach. And then the bomb hit, and then that was it. So I came home uh, after we occupied China for a bit, um, and then came home. Uh, but Truman <clears throat> uh, called Potomac fever uh, an endemic disorder, the symptoms of which are a swelled head and decline in common sense. <laughs> and uh, I can attest to that because the minute I got to Washington, uh, we had the television cameras and all the interviews and swearing-ins at the White House and all that stuff. And, and almost immediately, I began to think I'd been transformed and was some, somehow superior <laughs> and uh, when I was really just another jerk like all of us. And, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, Immediately, and this is the problem with Washington today, immediately you become obsessed with increasing the budget of your, of your particular department. You're so in, in, interested in uh, what you're doing and you become swept up in it, even if it's irrational. In my case, I don't think it was irrational because we were in the middle of the Cold War and I was str struggling to build a weapon systems to offset the Soviet buildup that we saw 10 years later was going to be the, high, the apogee of the Cold War. And so we be began the 10-year lead time programs like the Trident and Aegis missile system, the F-18. Uh, I happened to be the captain of the team at that time. And those are the ones when we had our, our reunions with the Soviet counterparts in 1991 in Moscow. Uh, they told us that those are the ones that broke the backs of the uh, of the communist of communism, uh, they just couldn't match us on, uh, on the Trident, which gave us the ability to project power against every city and every major city in Russia, and the Aegis missile system, which gave us the ability to stop any of their incoming missiles, and the F-18 to project, continue to project power, and they and they also, after 20 toasts, I don't know if you've ever been involved with the Russians or the Soviets, but they drink a lot of vodka, and uh, and we were at the October uh, uh, Fest Hotel, uh, which is uh, communism is all about image. Uh, I'm always amazed at how many people that I run into are communists uh, who believe in this stuff. Uh, it, when you get to Moscow, you find out it's it's all about image. The, the October Fest Hotel. Uh, serves caviar and they do the laundry for you and they give you uh, boxes of Cuban cigars if you're a communist and the rest of the people are starving to death and going bust. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's a system that favors a very few people at the top. And, uh, uh, and the communists themselves know that, by the way, and they talk about it openly. Uh, it's only the naive people in this country that somehow think that it's some sort of a nirvana. It's not at all. But uh, one of the things they, they said, they told us that after 20 or 30 of these toasts of vodka, and by the way, you have to drink the whole, they all watch you like a hawk. <laughs> and you have to drink the whole glass each time. You can't just pour it down your shirt, which I was trying to do. And, uh, and boy, you're, you're, you're really drunk at, the, and at 3 o'clock in the morning. And most of these communists that we were dealing with, uh, our counterparts had medals all the way down to their trousers, and, uh, and they had a distinct uh, 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 left, uh, 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 just uh, like uh, backbones, uh, 
bent to the left because the metals were so heavy. And most of them weighed about 300 pounds, I guess, they were big fat bellies. But they like to talk about the great old days, how uh, when uh, the president of Czechoslovakia, they couldn't talk him into uh, uh, leaving Czechoslovakia uh, uh, and uh, by bribery, by offering uh, honorary degrees to him or something like that, because they had the tanks outside. Uh, and but finally they finally they found some excuse to get him out of the country and then and the guy that was in charge of it uh, after the fourth toast he said and then we moved and we crushed them <laughs> and everybody cheered it was such a, we crushed them and uh, and they took Czechoslovakia that way and uh, these and the greatest memories these wonderful communist generals had was that. Uh, of these great victories in the past. And, uh, but they did tell me one thing, that the person they admired the most was not Jimmy Carter, who was giving away America on the installment plan or, or any of the other presidents, uh, uh, but it was Ronald Reagan. They said he had a backbone, and they said he was our hero. He armed you guys to the teeth. He had a backbone. We couldn't break him. We couldn't bend him. And uh, they admired him. And it's, that's the old communist uh, idea, they told me, that. <laughs> Uh, you stick the knife in, and if you find butter, you move. Uh, and if you hit steel, like Reagan, uh, you stop. And uh, they, they're opportunists, and they're doing that today. And I'll talk about it a little bit about our weapon system programs now, because this is a repeat of the 1975 scenario that I lived through and had responsibility for. And I see the problem right now for the 10-year lead time, and I'll talk about it in the end, a little bit. Uh, one of the things that... Uh, uh, Mr. President asked me to talk about was the economy and the economic situation, and particularly it's a particularly important moment to be here in the light of the Chinese problems and the crash and all that, with so many uh, very brilliant and fine economists and those that are interested in serious and the serious aspects of America economy and, and life here in this country, uh, that are, are, uh, and the veterans that are here tonight. Uh, one, one of the things that uh, after the night, I remember very well in the 87 crash and the 99 crash and the savings and loan crash of 89 and, and the 1907 crash, um, <clears throat> people are always jumping, and the commentators are always jumping on the 1929 parallels and, and, uh, and, uh, and amazingly we always had a very nice recovery afterwards. So there's a tendency to relate everything to 29 which I lived through, uh, some of you did. Uh, the 29, 30s, the 37 crash, which was the rich man's panic, which was much worse than the 29 for most people that had survived with any money, um, uh, 29, 33. Uh, but um, comes now, uh, there is a parallel here uh, to 29 uh, that may be more ominous than 87, uh, by the way, most of these, uh, the 29 crash occurred on a pyramid of debt, but, but there was no outside shock, so to speak, at that time that caused the, uh, Schumpeter, who was a pro my professor at Harvard, uh, used to say that, um, <clears throat> uh, that outside shocks determine the role of the economy, outside shocks to the economy. And it could be government, internal government action like raising taxes. Uh, sharply like Hoover did in 1931 from 25% to 63%, which prolonged the depression, which was one of the root causes of bringing in Roosevelt and the crashing and the, uh, and the tremendous drop in prices that were on the road to recovery in 31. Uh, we had a couple of rallies after that where the market actually got up to 29 uh, and which, when it was, and then it tailed on down with this tremendous increase in taxes the, and, and mid-32 to 90% uh, cut drop from 381 down to three, 380, uh, 38 or something like that. Uh, and uh, that's all my father ever used to talk about. It was all so disappointing. But uh, still, um, uh, the, the parallels uh, are not too dissimilar because the Fed, starting in 1921, uh, uh, Began, began to have, uh, so that was the first QE1, so to speak. Uh, the Fed stepped in heavily with uh, the commodity crash of 21. Uh, 
the debate among economists and here at AIER and other places is do, the, do commodity crashes uh, uh, lead to equity stock market crashes or is it the reverse? Uh, I think it's 50-50. I'm not sure. I mean, looking back over history, uh, and, and I don't see uh, there's a I don't see there's a cause and effect directly. Uh, I mean, one doesn't predominate over the others. But in the case of 21, uh, the commodity crash uh, it, it, it led uh, it was was uh, certainly led the equity crash since Fed stepped in heavily. Uh, and uh, and then in 23, as you know, uh, as you uh, may uh, well read, you've known about from reading, uh, 23, the Fed bought back, uh, uh, sold back the bonds, and interest rates uh, skyrocketed. And it was a crash again, uh, 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 caused a decline again. And then uh, and then when the Florida land boom came in 1926-8. They were selling underwater land in Florida. Everybody's going to retire down there, mm -hmm. and what have you. Uh, and uh, and the Fed stepped in again to uh, to save the situation, and then uh, and then bought back bonds, and then uh, and sold bonds, and then uh, and then uh, and then became very free all the way up to 29, and there's a pyramid of debt. Uh, and uh, but that that uh, the outside trigger for 29. Was of course the margin accounts. You could borrow ten uh, percent, borrow ninety percent on equities, and there was an encouragement to do so. And uh, the stock market tripled since twenty one, uh, and uh, and uh, so uh, that pyramid of debt uh, was was due for a, a collapse. It had been a long term recovery, so to speak, a, a real, uh, from twenty twenty one, and uh, so. Uh, the market collapsed, but it had a big rally. Morgan stepped in, and a lot of other people stepped in, and there was a lot of, a little bit like China, going out and telling the boys to buy stocks, and there was an awful lot of encouragement to buy stocks, and stocks did rally substantially uh, through 30, and uh, and then, uh, and by the way, in 29, in October, that week uh, before for Black Tuesday, uh, there were many rallies. Uh, there was a big drop. And then there was a rally, a little bit like the last few days. And then there was a drop again. Today it's up 600 points. I mean, there are some substantial parallels, both on the QE2 and QE1 that occurred in the 20s. Uh, the pyramid of debt, which we have today, and, and, uh, and, the, and the Fed had shot its wad uh, by 29, and uh, as it has today, uh, unlike the period of 87 and 91, 99, and what have you that I talked about. So uh, uh, there aren't many. Uh, there's a little more parallel today, Mr. Sh Mr. President, than I think there was in 87, uh, which all, we all lived through, of course. Uh, and at any rate, comes now uh, uh, the uh, situation, and uh, I have some stuff on that. 20s, you don't want to hear about that. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, the crash, uh, the situation in, in uh, we've had some serious crashes. The long-term capital uh, uh, fiasco in '98, when the Fed stepped in and saved the day. Uh, there was ammunition to do so at that time. Uh, the savings and loan crisis of the nine early 90s and, and uh, the 87 crash, the Fed could step in and each time uh, I created a bubble afterwards and then uh, later on, and then of course the 2008 housing uh, bubble. Uh, but always the Fed had, had uh, 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 purchasing power. And uh, today the Fed's up to four and a half trillion uh, balance on the balance sheet. They, we're the only country in the world I think that can print money and, and create uh, money out of thin air and 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 uh, issue bonds uh, or or buy bonds back at, uh, buy bonds and uh, uh, lower the interest rates to virtually nothing. Uh, the rest of the world uh, doesn't have that facility. Uh, and uh, uh, and how long the rest of the world is going to rely on the dollar as the reserve currency of the world? 
I don't know as we keep running up this uh, 17 or 18 trillion dollars of debt. But that's not the least of our problems. Uh, that's not the most important part of our problems, as I'll cover later on. Um, and then uh, the uh, comes uh, Ludwig von Mises. I uh, was very blessed to have audited his courses at NYU afterwards, and he also re reiterated that the outside shocks to the economy uh, are the important things. By the way, Schumpeter was a f it looked like Kuba Charlie. Khan, uh, the Chinese movie actor, had a great big bald head, blisters on top, and uh, a wonderful man. But uh, uh, the Keynesian philosophy at Harvard, where I was studying, uh, had a thousand uh, Seymour Harris and, and uh, all the rest of the liberal, liberal uh, government control uh, Keynesian economists had a thousand students in their class and there were only eight of us in the postgraduate uh, course Schumpeter was giving. I was honored to be one of them. Um, I didn't know enough uh, to know that he was the best, but my father was so big on ec economics and economy all the time that he told me to go to Schumpeter. Snake oil, uh, the, uh, the Fed has had room in those days, we call it the snake oil of artificially lowering interest rates uh, that's not available today. Uh, I remember Arthur Burns, uh, who, with whom I served as ambassador in, in Europe. He was over in Germany, I was in Holland. And we used to talk all the time. He was, I, he, uh, was very active in, in saving Nixon's bacon in the 72 election by uh, uh, easing money, and uh, uh, he was not political, and uh, but he was a very great economist. My shoe keeps dropping off here. Uh, the president told me to keep your shoes on, and pants on too. So it uh, comes now, uh, uh, but but uh, unwittingly or what have you, he, he eased money so that the 72 election uh, was a success for Reagan. Uh, for Nixon, I, I suspect that Nixon probably regretted running again in 72 because of Watergate that appeared later on, and he had to get out of office and, and what have you. But Arthur, Arthur um, uh, was unfairly criticized uh, a, by the Washington establishment uh, for, for infla engineering the inflationary policy that helped reelect Nixon in 72. Uh, some of the uh, unfair congressmen used to say he was a good economist. Uh, he was, he was a, a, a good economist, and, and like the fabled honest politician, once he was bought, he stayed bought. Uh, uh, today's U.S. economy has a lot of positive things in it, uh, housing, uh, 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 unemployment is down, although the, uh, the non-working part of the population uh, is extremely high at the moment, and uh, there's been this huge shift to entitlements in this country where, it does, where a lot of the millennials are not actually working, living with their parents and uh, getting benefits from the government, and, uh, and there's a tremendous amount, at least in my area, of pot smoking and what have you, uh, and everybody's on, playing games on the internet and what have you in the locked-in bedroom upstairs. Uh, of their parents' houses, and, and it's a shame that there's not the incentive that all of us in this room had. We were, when we got out of school, we were like, uh, had a blowtorch to our rear end. We were all <laughs> you know, going at it like mad to get a job and work hard and and build America and, and do a great job for our families and what have you. Uh, I don't see that now. I worked five years over at, uh, as, a, as a volunteer and I got out of government as, a, as teaching art at the Bristol County House of Correction. And uh, a lot of the young people I found from Fall River in my area uh, are wonderful kids. Uh, but they go home to, the, uh, once they get out of prison, they go back to the old life of selling to their cousins and what have you, the narcotics. And they're back in three months later. Uh, and it seems like a uh, endless rotation there, the 66 or 70 percent uh, recidivism, uh, and um, and they don't have any job opportunities. Uh, 
Trump is probably right. A lot of the low-cost entry jobs have been take, taken by the illegal immigrants. And uh, uh, I know it's not politically correct to say that, but uh, uh, they, uh, there's no incentive. Uh, and, and they're told that it's, it's demeaning to take uh, entry-level jobs like all of us did when we had to start. I started the Bank of Manhattan Company at $2,000 a year in 1947 with two degrees. And that's $40 a week, a dollar a day. And uh, I worked in 1936, uh, 37 for 25 cents a day as a runner. Uh, everybody worked in the summertime. Uh, and uh, uh, in 30, in 37 was, was the year that Roosevelt uh, raised. He'd already done the NRA, which brought in all the tough unions and all the strikes everywhere there was a strike. All the, oh, in Detroit there was a strike every week. And uh, uh, it seemed like strikes were a part of the system of life at that time. Roosevelt was encouraging it. Uh, and uh, everything, everybody was unionized. And, uh, and uh, in addition to that, Roosevelt raised taxes in a peak to 91% and uh, later proposed a 100% uh, tax. So who's going to get out of bed for 100%? <laughs> I'm, I would, but, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and Truman later on proposed a 10% surtax on top of the, uh, uh, wealth tax on top of the, uh, 10, 91%. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it, it, business collapsed in 37. And uh, my father said, well, everybody's got to go to work. And so we all went to work. You know, I got 25 cents a day working a, uh, as a runner. And, uh, and you might say, well, 25 cents doesn't sound much, but in four days you got a dollar. And if you have a dollar, you're the only guy in the street with a dollar. Hmm. So, and you could, you could live for uh, 75 cents a day and what have you. You could get, get a sandwich for a nickel. And even many of us in this room remember after the war, we went to the automats and we could get a sandwich for 10 cents cup of coffee for three cents and what have you. And we, I lived at the automat. I'm sure many of you did, 1946, 47, 48. Uh, and uh, we've had this huge inflation since then. Uh, and uh, uh, all of us have lived through this period. Uh, comes now, uh, uh, we have some good things going in this country. Uh, this may not be 29. We'll probably have a good recovery. Let's hope so. Now, is China? The collapse of China and Dan Oliver, of, uh, the president of CMRE, I'm the chairman, uh, feels that China's done. It, he looks at the debt pyramid there. He looks at the uh, uh, government interference there. <clears throat> the 23 automobile companies in China all have to have joint ventures with a politician from China as a 50% owner. So uh, it, China is not a free, free market country, as some people think. It's not really capitalist. Uh, and it's very, very communist, by the way. And uh, they've never forgotten, uh, neither Russia or China have forgotten world domination as, as the ultimate goal. Uh, don't think that, uh, that this little South China Sea thing and building an island, we could take that island out tomorrow uh, with, uh, with the Pacific fleet. But uh, it's, China is not really, uh, the real issue is, is is, is uh, world domination, and I'll go into that in a little bit, but, uh, and uh, it's really a great threat. But, but basically comes now, um, China used more cement in the last three years than the United States did building these ghost cities and ghost uh, shopping centers and what have you. You've, you've all seen these ghost cities, pictures of them and what have you. Um, then the United States used in cement in the last century. Huh. And uh, China was uh, using 50% of the world's copper. It's collapsing now. 40% uh, of the world's aluminum and many, many other raw materials. You remember how they went to Latin America and bought up every country, Australia and iron and coal, rather, and, uh, and, they, and Africa, and everybody says they're going to buy up everything. They're going to own everything. It's a little bit like I'm, uh, all of us are reminded that we lived through this of when the Japanese and their big boom before the cla cra crash uh, bought Rockefeller Center. And everybody said, oh, isn't this terrible? They bought Rockefeller Center. I said, what are they going to do with it? Pick it up and take it to <laughs> right. Japan? Right. Uh, at one time, at one time uh, uh, the, uh, I think it was the Chilean embassy 
I can't remember the embassy, uh, and the grounds of the Chilean embassy was worth more uh, than the gross national product of Ecuador or even Chile. So they sold it, <laughs> something $5 billion or some crazy figure. Uh, it, it, what a boom Japan had then, and of course it collapsed. Now it's, it's uh, debt to GDP ratio is two to one. And uh, of course most of that's owed to itself. Uh, but uh, and uh, but it's China, uh, Japan is, has, has never come back. Uh, it's a little bit doing a little bit better right now, and uh, and by the way, it's beginning to rearm too, which I think is good because that's an offset to China. Uh, it, uh, Russia, uh, but uh, so we have some pluses in this country, but there are parallels to 29 uh, in October. That week, there were two or three rallies, and then the market collapsed. We're having a couple of rallies now, uh, and, uh, and whether, whether the market's going to collapse, uh, this is a dangerous time right now because of not only the Chinese collapse, uh, and Germany, 5% of they're affected with their exports to, uh, to China. Uh, the White House spokesman the other day said, oh, we don't have any real exposure to China. We don't export much to them. In fact, we import so three times as much. But uh, that's not true. General Motors uh, has $10 billion invested there, uh, and they're putting another $5 billion into another plant, or they were uh, planning that two weeks ago. Uh, and uh, 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 we, we see Caterpillar is heavily invested there, one of the friends here I met today said he's buying some Caterpillar, but that's, it, it's probably got, it's worldwide diversified, so it's going to be all right. But uh, Caterpillar uh, is very much affected there. Chevron is very much affected there. Huge investments. Uh, Apple's uh, sales are down 20% in the last five weeks in China. Um, so uh, we are involved. It's much more than what the White House spokesman said in an optimistic note. Uh, they're always trying to Make things look good because it's political, you know. You don't get elected if you have, if you ride in as, as the Republicans did after raising taxes in 20 in 31 uh, to uh, 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 from 25 percent to 63 percent because Andrew Mellon said we got to balance the budget. He, d he ignored the fact that the it's an outside Schumpeter's outside shock. That's an outside shock that would kill the economy. It just just like they say that if the Fed raises rates today, it could, could damage the economy, uh, which means that they probably won't raise rates at least until December or perhaps not even until next year. Uh, it, uh, it, it's more symbolic because they're not going to raise them much more than 25 basis points, but it's, it's, it's the symbolism that goes around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, by the way, another outside shock that really perpetuated the the, cra the crash in 31, uh, when things were starting to recover. And by the way, in 33 and 34, the in unemployment rate got down to 0.4%. So we were well on the recovery. And Roosevelt ran as, almost as a conservative. Many people voted for him because Hoover and uh, Mellon had been such a disaster. Uh, and uh, But it was the credit onslaught uh, bankruptcy. Uh, you know, people say, well, is credit onslaught like China? Is there a parallel there? Uh, nobody had ever heard of credit onslaught. Uh, and, uh, and yet, there was the largest bank in Austria and had credit ready relationships with about every bank in the, in, in the world. And, uh, and that, when that collapsed, the house of cards started to fall all over Europe. And, uh, and that affected the United States. And so the markets, tailed down very sharply in, uh, and later in 31 as a result of that. Uh, it seemed like endless problems were coming and then the NRA came in in 33 and it closed down most American businesses in the sense that their margins accounts with the strikes and higher labor, higher labor costs uh, on a very thin margins as it was uh, kill, killed, killed the economy. <coughs> and then it started to recover again in 35, 36. 37, I remember it, uh, uh, Rose, uh, when, when Roosevelt raised the uh, t tax rates, it absolutely collapsed the economy, and the economy didn't recover. Uh, then we had a sharp 
drop in the market in 1940, and, and then we were on a war footing and everything boomed and we had excess profits. Uh, is gold going to be the answer as, as, if, the, if, the, if we go into a, multi, a huge inflation to offset all this pyramid of debt and what have you? Uh, it should be uh, normally, but uh, we all remember uh, that uh, in 1933, government interference came in, Roosevelt came in and bought up, put you in jail if you didn't turn in your gold at $20 an ounce. A year later, he was selling gold in Europe for $35 an ounce, making a profit. But it was a corrupt act, and if there ever was one. And, but gold was uh, a criminal act to own during the 30s, as you know. Uh, comes comes now, uh, the uh, is a slightly political statement. Uh, I don't I, I don't see this uh, the credit onslaught in China being a, a total parallel, uh, uh, and uh, and because uh, I I think that we have the banks are much stronger now from from a capital point of view. Uh, 10,000 or more banks were closed in the bank holiday after the bank holiday in 33, uh, Roosevelt. And um, I don't see that we may have a bank holiday for another reason I will tell you about. But I don't see that as a, as a, as a possibility now because the banks are so much stronger coming out of 19, uh, 2008. But uh, it, it, uh, so we, I don't think it's 29 uh, any more so than 19. 87, but I do see that the Fed is out of ammunition, Mr. President. And uh, <coughs> as, as Arthur Burns used to tell me all the time, when the Fed, it, it's like pushing on a string. When the Fed doesn't have any anything left, uh, where is the last resort? And I'm not sure there is one at this stage of the game. Uh, one of the one of the uh, so comes now um, is. Uh, uh, so there's basically no hiding place at the moment. Europe is flat. Their economies are tail tailing down, or they're having a little bit of rally right now. Uh, but the German uh, DAX is off 20, over 20, 25 percent, uh, affected by the Chinese collapse because of their exports, so, although it's only 5 percent of the German economy. And uh, But one of the things that uh, I worry about now is, are the derivatives of the main uh, the big five banks. Uh, you know, the, gen the world's GDP is 70, 70 to 80 trillion. U.S. GDP is about 16 trillion. <coughs> the capital of Bank of America, for example, is a, bit, a trillion six. Bank of America has $56 trillion of derivatives, which is almost the entire world's GDP. So does J.P. Mor JP Morgan. Chase has a, tr a 50 trillion. Uh, uh, Goldman Sachs, 50 trillion. Citibank, 50 trillion. More or less, 55, 46, or what have you. I'm, I can give you the exact figures. Uh, so those five banks have about $225 trillion of, of uh, derivatives. Those are 80, 81% uh, of those are, are against interest rates. <coughs> Protections. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to. I wish this were a vodka. Eighty uh, percent are against interest rate uh, uh, protections, uh, and five percent against are against uh, credit risks. The rest are are against uh, uh, commodities and what have you. They're all collateralized with gold, uh, with dollar, uh, with with. Uh, um, treasuries or cash. Uh, in, 19, in 2008, we had the crash of AIG and Lehman because the, other, the counterparties to these derivatives couldn't cash in the collateral. That's been changed now. Uh, we, uh, the counterparties can now cash in the collateral. There's, we're still, 95% uh, uh, of, of all these derivatives are still unregulated. <clears throat> but uh, Congress and, and the banks are trying to negotiate now in the next few months an agreement to, so that it's all regulated. And uh, 
Uh, so uh, hopefully there'll be some protection. But this, with $628 trillion worth of worldwide derivatives, nine times the gross national product of the world, and uh, 225 trillion in the United States, never discussed, by the way. I, how many of you have read it in the financial papers at all? Uh, and uh, but we at CMRE and AIER are very familiar with it. And uh, 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 people say, well, uh, since it's cash and uh, and up to five-year uh, treasuries and, and high-grade bonds as collateral, how could there be any risk? But supposing interest rates go to 6% or somebody and a counterparty, if Morgan, J.P. Morgan goes to, to Morgan Stanley and says, okay, pay up, we're going we're gonna to cash in your collateral, uh, where are all those trillions going to come from? So one brick could fall like credit on stock. And, uh, the Fed would, uh, not all of that, of course, is exposure because uh, so many, so much balance, but, uh, but supposing it's 20 trillion, that's a th equal to the U.S. gross national product, the Fed will, of course, step in and, and try to save the day, but can you imagine the, the crisis that would occur if the Fed stepped in for 10 trillion, 20 trillion on, in a great nightfall? Uh, it's not beyond the realm of possibility. But neither is, is a crash going home tonight in your car. But you buy an automobile insurance against it anyway. Uh, uh, you hope you'll, you will lose your premiums. And so does the insurance company hopes you will lose your premiums. They're both on the same side. You don't want to claim and, because you might end up dead. And the insurance company doesn't want to claim because they don't want to pay you. <clears throat> and, uh, but in, in the derivatives case, it's such a monumental figure. Uh, I have no doubt that most of it's covered, uh, but uh, it's something I think that could be the final trigger, uh, like credit on stock uh, in 31. Uh, and I could be wrong. I'm just saying uh, that uh, since I've been, as I mentioned to the president, I've been kicked around by experts for 75 or 80 or 90 years. Uh, long enough, and like a, uh, like any kind of mule getting kicked with a big board in the back, I finally learned a few things, and I'm trying to pass it on to my friends here. Uh, so it's something that I think you should look into and examine carefully uh, and uh, prepare yourself in your retirement money and what have you the best you can. And that may mean a couple of gold coins in the, hidden away somewhere just to stay alive for a while or a couple of silver dollars. Uh, and a, a little bit of food stored up somewhere. Uh, and uh, it seems silly to talk about it this way, but uh, every other country in the world just about has been through this kind of scenario except us. We've lived a privileged life. Now, come, uh, come now uh, thanks to you heroes that have kept us alive in the military over these years. Now comes now, comes now the question of China and Russia, are they a threat? Does the oil price collapse in Russia, wiping out 61 percent uh, their exports? Uh, oil is 61 percent of their GDP, <clears throat> and uh, of course, that oil tailing down to below 40 <coughs> has uh, dramatically affected their GDP. Uh, they had about 400 billion dollars of reserves before this. Uh, they're going to start eating into that pretty heavily pretty soon. Now, will that start cutting out some of the uh, huge uh, uh, expenditures, uh, military expenditures, where they've been developing the S-500 missile, which is most, one of the most effective anti-missile defenses in the world. The, uh, uh, the Chinese and the Russians have formed a, uh, a to uh, they formed a Molotov-Ribbentrop agreement that we all remember in 1940, the Soviets and the, Rus and the Germans formed. Uh, they formed an agreement similar to that. Will uh, these combined uh, communist forces be a threat to us 10 years out? I say yes, uh, because they're building uh, rapidly. Will, they, will the economic collapse in, Ch in China, if it occurs or goes further, uh, cut into their defense expenditures? Or will the collapse in oil prices cut into the defense expenditures of, 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 of Russia? I, I say no no more so than it did uh, with uh, Stalin in the 30s when he, uh, when he used uh, 
he, he prioritized defense military spending. It was up to a huge percentage of his GDP and starving the people to death, uh, the kulaks and what have you. Everything was focused on military expenditures in those days because communists do that to stay in power. They're always paranoid. They think that they're being encircled. Encircled China thinks they're being encircled when we send the fleet in and take a look at uh, the Spratly Islands built islands uh, uh, building that they're doing there or what have you. And our so-called Pacific Pivot, where we sent some Marines over to Australia and we've got a fleet over in the Pacific and what have you. Uh, the Russians are, are, are paranoid too because uh, we're helping Ukraine a little bit. Uh, we we're, putting, we're helping Estonia and Latvia uh, and a few of the perimeter countries uh, building up their defenses. We're, we don't have any, the U.S. has no tanks in Europe. NATO is pretty much of a shell of what it was. But we're trying to send so many missile defenses in there now and what have you. And Russians are paranoid about that, especially over the Ukraine, uh, which toyed with the idea of joining NATO at one point. Uh, I doubt if that will happen. Uh, and, uh, but at any rate, uh, so I think they'll prioritize military spending more. They, they, the uh, the uh, Soviets and Chinese are developing the Topol-M missile, 15,000 mile an hour missile, our Aegis system, which you kindly mentioned, uh, has, has, a, has a much uh, lower speed. We can't hit it like a bullet hitting a bullet as we could with the old missiles that are com incoming. Uh, and uh, they're develop uh, China is developing this huge submarine force. The next war will be fought in space, and uh, uh, ten years out, when the when those huge military expenditures come to fruition, uh, space uh, where they can knock out our satellites, the MP threat where they can knock out our utilities. Eighty percent of the uh, utilities in the country could be affected by a couple of nuclear blasts over Omaha, let's say, uh, and. Uh, and we, and we don't have the backup generators to supply those. It takes a year or two to build those things, and we have, don't have the backups uh, for the utilities. I think I saw a study one time that if they do knock out our satellites upon which all of our communications and military communications and our own internet communications and communications depend, and if they do knock out our Utilities, and we lay naked, of course, here in this country to an incoming missile. Um, and uh, something like 80% of the population would die within eight or nine months. Mm. Uh, there would be fighting, fights for food. Walmart sh shelves would be empty in a half an hour. Uh, you know, agriculture is now concentrated pretty much in the Midwest. The farms are gone here. Uh, what have you, food would be in short supply. And a uh, friend, of, Neighbor against neighbor, it would be as people fought to stay alive for a matter of weeks if they could. Uh, so these, I'm paranoid because I've lived through a couple of wars and, and I've lived through 90 years, like many of you, and uh, 91 years, and uh, I've seen all these things. So I'm paranoid about the worst that could happen. I'm only spelling out that because it's like insurance policy. It's only a small percent happening. Should we? What should? What should, uh, what should we do? Uh, and how, how should we, what should we be doing? We should be building our defenses, not cutting out our long lead time programs as we have done since the sequester program that occurred. It's, the next war is going to be primarily Navy uh, under the sea and in space. And uh, because the Chinese have developed the DF-21 missile, it can knock out the deck of an aircraft carrier with the, many rockets and uh, it, we, the carriers won't be as effective as they would be in the World War II or in the post-war period. Um, and I say that with regret because I've helped build a few carriers. Uh, and and we're building uh, some new ones right now, the John F. Warner and, and Jerry Ford. Um, Three billion dollar expenditure and, uh, and some of the programs we're building now aren't necessarily going to keep us alive as well as they might. I'm talking about the LCS, where we put in $31 billion, and, and uh, I think a government study recently s indicated that it it's, can't even defend itself very well, uh, much less project power. And we've got, and the only way that we can survive is in 10 years when, when the Soviets and the Chinese will ex meet or exceed our own capabilities uh, and, uh, in space and, and under the sea. Uh, uh, we can't be building systems that can't project power. 
We also have the problem with the Zumwalt well class. I'm not sure just exactly where it, it comes in. Uh, there's uh, hundreds of billions of dollars have been spent on, on the F-35, and uh, it's had so many problems, and there's a question whether it's that much better than the F-18, which I helped develop 40 years ago. So I, I'm, I, I'm, of course, I'm out of step, but I, I, I don't see, I don't see uh, the leadership uh, I, I, the leadership is great. The Pentagon and the Navy want to do things, but their hands are tied by the President and uh, the Congress on sequester and Valerie Jarrett and those people that really run the Pentagon and uh, tell, them, tell them to shut up and keep their heads low and not speak up. You never hear it. Uh, the only pronouncement the President has made, not looking at the Chinese threat or the Russian threat at all, the only pronouncement he made was at the Coast Guard Academy that the biggest threat to America in their graduation speech a couple of months back was global warming. Uh, global warming may be a threat, uh, and it, of course it's scientifically disputed this way or that, but that's probably 50 or 100 years from now. Not many of us, some of you young people will be around then, but uh, most of us have to, are going to be around, hopefully, I won't, I'll be long dead, but I'm worried about you young people uh, 10 years from now when the great nightfall may come. So that's, uh, that's why we should be building our military now and not uh, be tangled up with uh, foolish ideas like preparing our whole Navy Department, buying, uh, buying uh, expensive uh, 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 solar fuels or what have you at $27 a uh, a gallon instead of 350 a gallon for diesel and what have you. We're not a social experiment. The military should not be a social experiment. And unfortunately, I, I think that that's under this administration uh, may be well-meaning and they may be guided that way, but uh, I don't think uh, they're looking, focusing on the long-range thing like all of us had to do in World War II and, were, and Vietnam and Korea and wherever we served. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you very, very much for that President, survey. President. So we have time for just a couple of questions. The key issue here, I think, is that uh, uh, the world has changed a lot and hasn't changed a lot. So we've got a lot of sort of turn circle, full circle back to some situations we've had in the 70s. We're maybe facing both economically and uh, national security-wise. And you're suggesting perhaps we're, we may be spending money in defense, but maybe on the wrong things. Is that the, basically what you're thinking in terms of the national security front? I don't see the long lead time pr planning that we went through in the 70s when we built the Trident, the Aegis missile system, the F-18 and others that you mentioned. And when the Soviet counterparts met with us in Moscow in, in, in 1991, they said those were the systems that broke their backs. Uh, they couldn't spend enough to match us. They went bankrupt, even though they prioritized defense to a high percentage of the GDP and starved their people, they couldn't match the programs we developed and where we could project power against them. Uh, and, uh, but I don't see that scenario 10 years out at the rate we're going now. We should be building today. It takes 10 years to build a weapon system. You have to build against potential capabilities. You don't build against intentions. I served 13 years or what have you in the State Department. We're always wrong analyzing intentions. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't forget the Japanese ambassador a couple of days before Pearl Harbor was telling the Secretary of State how much the Japan, Japan loved us. Uh, intentions can change overnight, but capabilities, you, if a guy next door to you has just put in three three-inch 50s and 42 AK-47s all aimed at your bedroom window, uh, you'd be a bit of a fool if you didn't uh, look out the window and, and uh, at least put in some uh, steel plates or something, mm -hmm. or, or at least get a, get a couple of pistols yourself, mm -hmm. right. in my opinion. All right. Thank you very much. So we have time for one question. Could you elaborate a little more on the extent to which the Chinese and the Russians are collaborating? Well, they started with the, so they have the so-called Silk Road that they're going to build from Manchuria or what have you, to, to uh, Belgium or what have you, uh, to the United States. Uh, to Europe, into Europe, so-called, and then there, there was a couple of years ago. There was this plan to, for Russia, at high prices, to sell to China all this oil. And they we're going to make a long-term contract. That's probably going to fall through. Uh, China is not a fool. 
they're not going to pay high prices for oil. They're going to, they're going to pay the world prices. But militarily, they both have the same goal in mind at the moment. Now, will it fall apart like uh, the Germans and the Russians did, uh, who was always the real enemy of Germany, at communism? Uh, a year later, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, but uh, I, I suspect if this coalition does hold, it's going to be the most powerful by far in the world militarily in 10 years. And will they be as benign if they ever reach superior, if we keep diminishing our long lead time programs, will they be as benign to us as we were to them when we had superior, superiority after the Cold War in 91? Right, right. Yeah. So the the issue really is we need to be planning ahead of more further, and the, these defense issues, unlike economic issues, where we don't have any powder, take a long time to catch up, and we're just not really in the mode of catching up with our potential adversaries who are building up pretty significantly. In 2020, we're going to start remodeling the Trident program. We're going to build one a year. Uh, that's not going to do it. We've got to be building systems starting today uh, uh, to meet, to be able to project power against potential adversaries. And uh, we know what their cap we pretty much know what their capabilities are going to be. Uh, and we pretty much know what ours are going to be. And right now, we're not building the long lead time programs to match theirs. Well, Ambassador Mindorf, I really appreciate you taking can, the can time. Can we have an economic question, too? How about an economic question? I, I, I don't, I know you guys are busy. And, and, but, but, and they always say the worst mistake in Washington is for a politician to get between uh, a, a guest and the bar. So, uh, so. so let me, I'll, I'll ask him a question. So I have a bet with one of our trustees that the Fed is going to raise rates before the year is out. And I'm feeling worse and worse about that bet every single day. Uh, what do you think they should do in terms of rates this year? Can I quote Mr. Mankiw? Sure. Uh, I wrote this, planning to read this, this very dull dissertation. Uh, <clears throat> but many are not as skeptical as Hayek about the ability of central bankers. Uh, no, no less than the former head of the Council of Economic Advisors, Professor Greg Mankiw, who teaches economics at Harvard, who I know, by the way, and has advised President Bush and Obama, said this. <clears throat> When you look at mistakes of the 1920s and 30s, they were clearly amateurish. It's hard to imagine that happening again. We understand the business cycle better. He said that on December 23rd, 2007, as the housing bubble was bursting. <laughs> so we shouldn't rely on the Fed to save our bacon. I don't think, uh, I think she's a wonderful lady, but I don't think she knows what any more than you and I or any of us in this room really know. It's all guesswork now because there's no more, nothing, nothing left in the, in the gun. Right, right. Great. Well, thank you very, very much for, oh, I guess we do have a couple questions in back. I have a question for you. What is exactly, the, the title of the lecture was? You're, you just got to repeat it because I can't hear you. I'll repeat it. Too old. The title of the lecture was National Security and European Economy. What is exactly national security? Can you explain it to us? National security? Yeah, what is oh, it? The exactly? concept that, the, uh, that our European... Uh, is it the, the farmer in Great Barrington that grows tomatoes or the Trident uh, submarines? What is it? What's the national security of the United States? So tell us when you were uh, Secretary of the Navy... Thank you. I'll, let me answer your question for you. Ambassador, tell me, when you were Secretary of the Navy, what was the time frame in which you had to make a decision regarding uh, incoming missiles from the, from the uh, subs? Well, well, every morning Rickover would come in to report me at a 6.30 Admiral's meeting and show me the locations of those six Soviet submarines 150 miles off our coast. Each one of them had ICBMs. And once they opened those bay doors, each one of those ICBMs was merved with 20 additional nuclear warhead tipped missiles. They could reach New York 18 minutes, Boston 33 minutes, and what have you. It wasn't a city on the East Coast that they couldn't demolish and cause 100 million deaths uh, inside, outside of 18 minutes. Uh, that's why I'm paranoid. 
Um, and um, the, the, the Chinese are now moving into that kind of position. And now with the Russian pivot to bring their submarines back into the, uh, to the, into the East Coast. We used to be able to tail, <clears throat> in those days, we could tail the Chinese, uh, the Russian submarine, Soviet submarines down from the Iceland Faro Gap where we had the Ososa system under the sea. And we could tail them, they come down to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and thinking that the turmoil in the ridge would, uh, would throw us off the scent. But our submarines knew where they were going, so we just parked ourselves <clears throat> on the other side of the ridge. And as they came into the East Coast, we were 2,000 yards behind them. We, were, we knew where they were at each moment. And I gave orders that whenever, uh, Admiral Holloway and I gave orders that whenever they opened that bay door to launch that missile, we were to destroy them before they could, in the, in the 30 seconds or a minute, to, take, to bring that missile up and, and launch it to, against New York or Boston or Worcester. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so uh, we thought we were fairly well protected. Uh, today, uh, they can sit further offshore because these new Chinese missiles uh, are 3,000 miles, 4,000 miles. Even Iran, if they get, uh, they're buying all these uh, missiles now from Russia and, and from other countries. And of course, if they get the warheads, uh, that it'll be devastating to Europe. They can, they're developing 1,200 mile missiles uh, to reach those cities and they can launch from Iran. Uh, and uh, it's one of the arguments against the so-called Iran deal here. Um, plus the fact that they had their own uh, self-certification program uh, at uh, the parking uh, facility where they're building the detonators for the nuclear warheads. And that's, uh, I was telling you, Mr. President here, that, that uh, those, those, uh, those uh, that self-certifying to the, uh, to the UN uh, that there's no, what, uh, there are no missiles here, uh, there are no, no nuclear warheads here. It's like a, a drug addict being arrested and supplying his wife's urine sample instead of his own. Uh, Self-certification, it's just sheer nonsense. We know that they lie on every occasion. Uh, communist countries always do that. And I had a, a lot of relationships with Iran before the Shah fell because I was selling him F-14s and destroyers. And he was moving towards democracy. Under the Carter administration, he was urged not to put down the riots <clears throat> that were occurring then uh, over some cause. And uh, he held back. And of course, the revolution came, and he was thrown out. Uh, it's really a tragedy, because that, next to General Marshall's uh, uh, being advised to bring in Mao, it was one of the great uh, turning points, I think, and, and uh, bad geopolitical decisions. Well, thank you very much. We have to prepare for our next event. I want to thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ambassador Middendorf, for your afternoon. And thank you all for coming to AIER. Good afternoon. Bye.